the, the story to be a, ch a champion or to stay champion is not a straight line. Mm. Sometimes you have some failure, then you have to go left, I'll come back, and you mess up something, you have to go back later, and, and that's how life is. Hello, Radical Health Seeker. Wow, do we have an amazing episode for you coming up with the one, the only, George St. Pierre. If you know MMA and the UFC, that name needs no introduction. If you don't, just know this. George is one of the MMA goats, one of the greatest of all time to ever do it. Welterweight champion at the top of the game for a long time. And if you train and compete at that level, you learn a lot about the physical body, the mind and life in general. So join us as we chat to George about that journey, what it was like to train at that level, to compete at that level, hear George's health stories, his insights from life. And then we take live callers on the show who get to ask George about transitioning into different phases of life, choosing different relationships and sports, training for longevity. This one is just jam packed with a genuinely humble killer who's full of insights, full of heart and full of wisdom. I think you're really gonna like it. Let's dive in. Welcome back to the show, Radical Health Seekers. We have an incredibly special guest joining me today. One of my personal heroes from the mixed martial arts world and an incredibly inspiring figure. Welcome to the show, George St. Pierre. How are you, my friend? Doing fantastic. Thank you for, for having me. Yes, thank you. I want to start this one because you won't know this, but it's a very interesting story and it's kind of weird for me to sit here. It's very full circle. The year, you'll probably remember better than I would, but it was probably around 2011 or 12. I was an, an aspiring potential MMA fighter. I was at a crossroads where I was, do I go professional? And one of my big uh, calls to action was, let me go train with the best in the world. And who was the best in the world? Who was the GOAT at the time? <laughs> it was this man right here. So a buddy of mine at home, we decided we're gonna go to TriStar Montreal and we're gonna stay there for six weeks and we're gonna train. We lived in the fighter dormitories and we trained with Faraz oh, and wow. we did the whole thing. And unfortunately, about two weeks or maybe four weeks before going out, you injured your knee. I believe it was in the lead up to the Diaz fight. Okay. And it kind of sidelined you for a bit. So I went out there and I was like, maybe I'll train with George and I'll get to roll with George. And it never happened, but it's very cool to sit here now, come full circle and sit with you in a different phase of our lives. Wow. And uh, it was just really cool, man, because that's a beautiful, that incredible gym that's produced some of the biggest names in MMA. So. Yeah, just uh, thank you for everything that you've done for me personally and the community and everything that you continue to do. Oh, thank you for 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 that. You know what I mean? I, I remember that time. It was when I I think I, I tear my ACL, unfortunately. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was a long, long time off. Yeah, I had yeah. to go through a rehab, a surgery. I, I even moved in in US, mm. in, uh, California to 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 get the surgery done by the best doctor, Doctor Ella Trash. Yes. You know, we did Tom Brady as well. So. It was a it was a tough time in in my life when that happened. I remember. Unfortunately, maybe we'll have a, a chance to train uh, yeah. again in the future. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. And that brings up a, a very good point that uh, for those that don't know who you are, if you are remotely familiar with MMA or the UFC, you know the name GSP. You're often thrown around in the top list of the greatest of all time. Been a very dominant champion for a very long time. But for those that don't know, what is MMA? What is this story? Like, how did you get into this crazy thing called cage fighting and then ascend to the top of the welterweight ladder and be so dominant for such a long time? Yeah, first, MMA, it's a sport that used to exist back in the day in ancient Greece, you know? So we are, we are a lot of people are thinking that it's a new sport and we discover it, uh, but they're wrong. Mm. It's an old sport, very, very old sport. And it used to be one of the most prestigious sport, one of the most, probably the most popular sport. Mm. It was called pancreation back mm. in the day. It was an ancient Greece uh, sport. Back in the day, it was, uh, it was so popular, they even stopped wars, you know, mm. when they had Olympic. It was at the Olympic game. So uh, they, they, they used to, to bring their, their best fighters mm -hmm. and compete against each other. Uh, of course, the rules were different back then um we know now that the the fighter they used to fight naked wow. and instead of tapping when you wanted to give up you have to point at the sky mm. so it's very interesting uh, uh, to read about it and sometimes it, it makes me wonder what would happen if our best fighters of of our time fight the best fighter of their time because mm. they did it for more than 800 years mm. and at that time if you if you think about it all the the best the greatest mind in the world 
were were involved into the the process of of trying to create the best fighters. So all the, these guys you hear about, like Plato, Pla, 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 Plato, yeah. the the philosopher was yeah. was a wrestler. It was re- like all these great minds that the, like the world had at the time knew about pancreation. Mm. They, they they were they were either practicing it or they were they were a fan of the sport. So uh, I really wonder sometime because we just rediscovered the sport for a few dec- decades yeah. and look how much it has improved. Mm. Imagine these guys back in the day, they did it for more than 800 years. Mm-hmm. I wonder how, how how good were they? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it makes me wonder. We, we have the tendency to believe that we're at the top of the food chain, but it's not. it might not be the case. You know? Yes, it's a very interesting theory, but you just said something I think is really important, which is when people hear the word fighter, cage fighter, MMA athlete, they just think it's all brawn and muscle and it's just like raw, masculine, but there's a mind piece oh. to this. And you're known for being quite a thinker, uh, like into philosophy, you know, qu- talking about Socrates and Plato and uh, the, the Stoics. And you're, you're, a, you're a thinker. It's, it's more to it than just the physical. There's almost like a warrior ethos that is, is very physical. Well, at the same time, it's a big mental game. And I know that's something you've spoke about in the past, but how much, how important is it to get the mind right in these games and how strategic and tactical is it as opposed to just how much is it muscles and toughness? Oh, well... When you reach a, a certain level in the, in the sport, like when you're at the elite level, every fighters are very athletic. Mm. So, are you more athletic than your your opponent, or are you less? It doesn't have a lot to do with with the victory. You know what I mean? It's about it's about technicality, knowledge. Knowledge is a is a weapon, and also one of the reason I believe the sport has evolved through through the years especially when it first started in the beginning is because of technology and knowledge. I remember when I was young, I, I was broke. I had to drive to New York to learn uh, what, what was an, an armbar, a jujigatemi, hmm. a straight armbar. Now I can have my cell phone, look it up online, and, and you know what I mean, to, to learn new technique. But before, I had to be physically in a, in a class yes. to learn new techniques, you know? So this is just one example of how knowledge is important and how... how you can get a be- better as a fighter just because of the technology. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, so it, the the athlete themselves are not better than they were. It's th- their their performances are better because of their their technology. Yes. And and if you don't believe me, because fighting is a very subjective form of of uh, of sport. You know, you always can say, "Oh, Muhammad Ali was better than Tyson," mm-hmm. or vice versa, or this guy is better than this guy because you cannot measure the performance. But if you if you, if you take a sport, for example, like uh, track and field or weight, li- like uh, Olympic lifting, you can measure the performance. Mm. And we know for a fact that Usain Bolt ran, ran, ran faster than Jesse Owen. But is he really better? Mm-hmm. Or it is because he has access to more technology and, and knowledge. And and they did an experiment. I remember I, I watched it. They took André the Andre de Grasse was who was I think a bronze medal at the last Olympic game. They made it run uh, against Jesse Owen, and the way they did it, they made Andre de Grasse use the same uh, mm. spike mm. on running on the same surface, no departure block, and guess who won? Mm. Jesse Owen won. Of course, they 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 compare Andre de Grasse against Jesse Owen when he beat the world record at the Berlin Olympic game and. Maybe the grass was not in his peak because a sprinter, for example, has certain moment in the season where he's in his peak, and that's very important. It has to do a lot with it. Has to do it has to do a lot with the result. Yeah. But it's just it's just to show you that technology and knowledge has a lot a lot to do with the the performance. Yeah, I think uh, in a sense we're all standing on the shoulders of giants, right? A hundred percent. I've heard you say in the past that big inspiration for you was Hoist Gracie coming into the UFC and doing what he did. Mm-hmm. Now, if you put his skill set in modern MMA, he's probably not going to do too well. But there's no GSP without Hoist Gracie. Yeah. And whoever comes next, whether it's Khabib or whether it's Islam, there's none of those guys without a GSP because they can only go further than what a potential GSP did because there was a GSP. So it's like this constant evolution, right? Like you carve the way and then you kind of pay it forward. You pass the torch on to next and more knowledge, more access to knowledge, more wisdom. 
And that's the path of continued evolution. Um, yeah, you said it better. I think it's Einstein. He says like, if I've seen further, further than others, because I'm standing on the shoulders of, the, of a giant, it's the same thing for me. Mm. I remember the uh, Heist Gracie, Mark Coleman, Ken Shamrock, uh, and all these guys, mm. they really inspire me and they, they made me who I, who I, who I, who I am. And I try to pass the torch and do the, mm -hmm. the same for the next generation. Yes, yes. And in a sense, like I stand on the shoulders of you and these other people that I've learned from. And it's just a, a wonderful synergy now that across the world, because of technology, we can have these kind of conversations. We can spread these stories. And like you said, I don't need to travel anymore to go to mm -hmm. Enzo Gracie Academy. I can download the, the instructionals and yeah. watch them on my phone. And that's a wonderful thing. But what always struck me about you is you're, you're, you're more than a fighter. You're a martial artist in every sense of the word. There seems to be um, MMA stands for mixed martial arts and you've practiced various ones. But what do you think the overarching ethos of a martial artist is? It's almost like a samurai code. It's almost like a code of conduct to live by. How do you still live by that today, that code of conduct, without necessarily being in the ring? Well, I, I start training first in my life because uh, I was victim of bullying. Hmm. Uh, I, I start martial art as a self-defense. So right away from the beginning, from the beginning, I didn't start because I wanted to compete. First, MMA did not really exist when I was young. I was, it was not a thing. So I start to, to, to learn karate at the time because I was victim of bullying and I wanted to defend myself. And it helped me to grow my confident, mm -hmm. confidence. Growing up as a kid, I, uh, I remember I was uh, someone who lacked a lot of confidence. Mm -hmm. And I believe uh, bullies are a little bit like predatory animal in nature. Uh, li lions, they don't, they don't go for the alpha bull. Mm. You know what I mean? They go for the one who's uh, who are injured or hurt, the, the weak one. Mm. And bullies are the same. They, 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 never go, they never go against the one who's who are strong. And when I was young, Growing up as a kid, I was, I, I remember when I was looking at myself in the mirror, I didn't like what I, what I was seeing. I was, I, I didn't like myself. I, did, I didn't like what I was, what I was, but I, I somehow, f when I start doing martial art, I, I f start to find, I start to find, f found, I found in love with who I could become. Mm. It gives me a sense of where I wanted to go. And I'm not talking about all my trophy and, and uh, belt. I'm talking about the person. Mm -hmm. And it taught me how to be confident. And, and, and confidence is something that you can work on. It's a very, it's a, something that you can change from the inside out. And I, it changed me. Karate changed me. And I wish I could tell you that I get rid of all my uh, bull, bullies because I, I kicked their ass. But that's not how it happened. It happened by because I changed myself from the inside out, and martial art gave me confidence, and I start to 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 change my demeanor. Instead of looking down, I was looking people in the eyes. Mm. When I shook someone's hand, mm. I was having a firm handshake, and and you know I was looking at the person. And when I talked to someone, I was like talking to him loud, and and you know I was, and it just by doing this, it changed my my entire life, and. Um, yeah, so that's why I, I when I we talk about martial art, I don't only train because I compete. I'm a martial artist. I train because it's my lifestyle. Mm. I, when martial art get into my life, it changed my life. And now I'm no longer competing to trying to be the strongest man in the world. I compete because because of longevity, because I want to because of my health. It's also a therapy. It helps me to be mm -hmm. a better person. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like you early on and still to this day are very process oriented. You enjoy the continued evolution, not necessarily just the outcomes. Because if you're only focused on the outcome, when you get the belt, you've made it, right? And you yeah. defend it a few times, I've made it. And this is what we see so often with fighters who were really at the pinnacle of the sport. And maybe after retirement, they get really out of shape and they get a little bit lost because yeah. maybe the outcome was their focus, not the process of continued evolution. You strike me as a guy that I'm going to be a martial artist until the day that I die because it's about becoming the fullest version of George that I can become. Yeah, and martial art is also how you treat people. It, it it's a lot more than just combat yes. uh, technique. It's it's a, it's a, has a lot to do with who you are as a person, mm. and it, it was a great learning process for me. And you just mentioned 
becoming champion it's extremely hard and difficult but staying mm. champion stay staying on top while you become the target mm. it's extremely difficult even more difficult and a lot of people ask me sometimes what kind of piece of advice you can give someone who's a who's a champion to stay champion and and the generic answer is always like yeah work hard train hard and then and, yeah it's true but i can i can be honest with you i'll 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 tell you what i truly think about it when you when you when you make it you know what i mean very often and not to sound bad because you know i th i think it's it can look make me look bad but but the people that are the most susceptible to make you fail and to make you drown is the people that are close to you. Mm -hmm. Your family, sometimes your friend. And not in a malicious way, more in a ignorant way. Mm -hmm. Because when you make it, a lot of times people that make it, it are people that doesn't does not come from money mm -hmm. or wealth like me. And when you make it, a lot of your friend sees that as an opportunity. So you might have a lot of, a lot of people out of nowhere they're coming to you like they're a friend of, of you, but they come, hey, let's open a restaurant mm -hmm. or, or they've never been in a restaurant business, but they mm -hmm. want to open a restaurant or a gym or, or you have all kinds of opportunity that comes to you. And you're, you tend to want to make people happy. So you're like, yes. yeah. And sometimes you might be influenced by these people and be like, yeah, let's do it. Or, or you have someone that needs money. So then you you borrow, you borrow some some money to one and another, so that's why I'm saying the people that are more susceptible to make you to make you fail are the ones that are close to you. So you need a very strong mind to make sure that you built a team around you. Mm. This is very important because it's a it's a sport that you're alone out there, but you're not really alone. You need to build a team of people that you trust and people that are comp competent, and having someone that you trust but turns out to be incompetent is just as bad as having someone that is competent but that you doesn't trust mm -hmm. because if you have someone who that you trust and is incompetent you might you might end up firing firing a, a family member or a friend which is bad because mm. it's going to hurt you and also if you have someone that is uh, competent but that you just don't trust he might take advantage of you Mm -hmm. And I'm talking to you about experience. So once you're champion, it's very important that you have a very, very strong foundation. Mm -hmm. And you need to build a team for that. And also, when you become champion, that's one thing. You need to be aware of your surrounding. Mm -hmm. Be aware of your surrounding. You know, all. The, that's why I'm saying, like, the, the, you need to be, you need to be careful. You know what I mean? Like, because the people that are the most susceptible to make you fail are people that you love. Mm -hmm. And not in a malicious way. So you need to, be, need to be aware of this. So that's the piece of advice that I give yeah. someone. Make sure you, you clean that up. You know what I mean? Not in a bad way, but in a good way, but build your team. You know what I mean? Like, if when someone come out to me with a project, for example, I have, I built my team already. So I have people that are very competent. I'm not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fiscalist. I'm not, you know, but I'm very good at finding people who have those compet competency that I, I had to my team that mm -hmm. I trust. So it's important. You need to do that. You can't manage everything because you're, we live in a world where everything is so uh, specialized. You can't have all the skills in the world. You're, mm -hmm. good, you're a good athlete. That's your thing. That's my thing. I'm good to perform. But I need someone who's a is a lawyer, someone who's an agent, someone who's a, like when I have someone coming to me, I say, I like your project, but I had to go through a, a process, and I yeah. will put you in contact with the person, and he's gonna that's his job mm -hmm. to say like yeah, it's interesting or no, it's not, and that's what guys need need to do. I feel sometimes they're not well organized. Yeah, uh, they don't they don't organize themselves that that way, and it's sad. It makes me sad sometimes to to witness. Yeah. And I think what's really interesting about that piece of advice is, like you said, it could be very classic, cliched advice of outwork the other guy and get stronger and work on your skills. But like you said, there's a certain point on the journey where the skills are marginally different. And it's mm -hmm. it's between the ears. It's the self-awareness. Yes. It's who you have around you. I often say that we absorb the values of our environment. And our environment is not just the place we live, but it's the people we're around. 
right? And those people around you, and especially as you ascend the ladder, you have a like bigger fall, you know, from the top to the bottom is a greater fall and people can kind of you know, latch on to the coattail. So this clearly has been something you've had to learn through experience. You said yes. that it's wisdom, right? It's testing these theories and probably having to go through some failures oh, and losses yeah. and all of that. 100%. Yeah. I, 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 uh, the, the, the line to be a champion or to stay champion, the, the story to be a, ch a champion or to stay champion is not a straight line. Mm. Sometimes you have some failure, then you have to go left, I'll come back, and you mess up something, you have to go back later, and, and that's how life is. And, and and I think our, we're driven by our emotion. Mm. All the choices that we've made has a huge influence on our performance mm -hmm. as an athlete. Mm -hmm. being, a, being a champion in MMA is not only in, in the cage. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking only about MMA, I'm talking about football, American football, hockey, baseball, Basketball. Do you know what statistically, for example, in the NFL, I, had, I I can't remember the number by heart, but statistic statistically, how many NFL player end up back, back bankrupt? Yeah, it's alarming. It's yeah. insane. It's very very sad, and and it's the same thing in every sport. You know what I mean? It. Sometimes I have parents that come up to me with their kids. They're they're a small kid, and they 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 look at me. They say. They say to me, hey, GSP, this is my son. And uh, he's the future world champion. And I look at the kid, I'm like, I say, I say to him, I say, it's good, you, you do martial art? And he's, he's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, you like it? Yeah. But I go, I go on my knees talking to him. I'm like, you know what is the most important thing for you, my, my friend? School education. Mm. That's what you need to focus on right now. Because becoming champion in MMA, the odds of su success is extremely mm -hmm. low. And I'm not only talking about MMA, I'm talking about football, basketball, say, same thing. It's extremely, extremely low. And especially in MMA, it's a very hard way to make a living. Mm -hmm. Hard way to make a living. And I don't wish that for all the people I love. So I'm tell, I tell the kid, I say, you like martial art, it's good. Train, you know. Remember, stay at school, education. That's what's go really going to help you to go further in life, you know? And, and it will also help you to make the right choice in your life, in your career, if you it turns out to, to go well. Yes, something solid to fall back on. Yes, yeah. yes, because it's not only in the cage. Mm -hmm. What is important is the choice that you make outside the cage Yeah, that will affect you. So I have a, an interesting question on that, what you were just saying, because I think people will tend to look at somebody who's reached the pinnacle in a sport and they will just admire that, rightfully so. And they will want that and they'll say, I could be the next GSP, I could be this, I could be that. But what a lot of people don't see is the cost of what it took to become that person. They just see the results. They just see you standing there with the belts and the accolades and the money and the fame that comes from that. But what is the cost of being GSP? What does it require to get to that level? Because it's not just sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. There's a lot of work that it often people are ignorant to they just wouldn't know so what is the cost of being gsp what did it take for you to get there yeah it's it's a lot of hard work a lot of sacrifice and when i say sacrifice i'm not only talking about time time and 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 injuries like in terms of scars physical scars it's also mental scars mm -hmm. in a way that you have a, so much stress for i can talk for myself i i I I live through so much stress. Like I I uh, that's why I I retire earlier because I'm aware that the stress is not good for you. Mm -hmm. You know there there's some good stress and some bad stress. Yeah. You know when you're you're on fighter's flight all the time, it's not good. You know, and f for myself, I when I first started, I I start to compete because I wanted to be the best in the world, but I never. I like to win, mm. but I never like to fight. Mm -hmm. I like to be able to train every day. The fact that it makes me very healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the science of the sport, but to compete and fight, I never liked it. Mm -hmm. And people are surprised when I say that very often. They're like, why did you do it? I did it because I like to win better than I, than I hate to lose. Mm -hmm. to, to lose. I use that to be, become a fighter, I used that to propel me where I wanted to be in life, to buy, to buy out my freedom. Mm -hmm. I was gifted of, 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 a, of a skill and I work really hard 
and I exploit that to bring me to 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 bring me where I wanted to be in life, to have the freedom, you know, the health. But that's why I retired. You know, mm -hmm. I retired with a smile. Yeah, I wasn't forced to retire. It's it's me who retired from the sport. It's not the sport who retired me. Yes, and unfortunately, in mixed martial art, it does not happen very often. A lot of guys they hang there way, way, way too long, and it's bad, especially for a combat sport. Mm -hmm. You can say I play football, I play mm -hmm. basketball, but you don't play fighting. No, <laughs> you live your you you, you left some yes. piece of your life out there. It could be brain damage. Every time you fight, you risk it all. You can die out there, yeah. or you, the damage that you will have will make you die younger. Mm -hmm. So I I'm, I was always very aware of it and that's why i'm very happy to to have retired I, I, you talk about the sacrifice that it takes and for me it was very very stressful mm -hmm. i never liked it before every fight i was like always asking myself the question I'm like what the hell i'm doing here <laughs> and i remember at a young age when i first started my started my career i always felt like i was not in the, in, in the right environment mm -hmm. because i was looking around me and all the guys I was training with, they were all happy. Yeah, I'm gonna fight Saturday. Yeah, and, and I was, I was thinking, I was like, are they putting on a mm -hmm. mask? Are they, are they faking it, or they really liked it? Because I don't mm -hmm. freaking like it. I'm, I'm afraid, and, and I, it makes me extremely uncomfortable to not knowing if I'm, if I'm gonna be humiliated, badly hurt, or winning. You know, but when you win, it's like a some kind of a drug of a, a feeling that it's undescribable it's mm -hmm. amazing and it's worth it. just for that it's worth it but to get there it takes a lot of sacrifice yeah. and it's unbearable yeah. unbearable and i i i can resonate with what you're saying to a degree because i did fight in mma i had four amateur fights and my last one was winning an amateur british title mm. and maybe in front of 200 people and just that feeling oh. that you describe right there it cannot be beaten and now i'm trying to think about well what does that feel like in front of 25,000 <laughs> people what does that feel like knowing that two million people are watching it and you're right you know that that feeling of undulation and overcoming i think is what it is because i'm very similar to you george i did not i love the training and the process but I had those very same thoughts walking out to the cage too. You know, your mom is in the crowd. What if I get knocked out in front of my mom and I'm the embarrassment? <laughs> so I've, I've heard you say in the past that there is no courage without fear. That's right. What, it, there's so much fear then on that journey, but what's the value in going beyond the fear for you? Fear can be your friend or your worst enemy. For my if I speak for myself, I always notice that I, I perform at my best when I feel like I'm at the edge of falling and in in, 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 in dying. That's when I perform at my best. And, and it's a weird feeling. But you need, you need to learn how to control it. Mm -hmm. And all, I think it's all linked to confidence. And I remember when I was young, I was thinking that, oh, now I'm afraid, you know, because I, I used to be extremely scared. I, and, and, and I was thinking like, oh, as time goes by and I get more experience, I'm not going to be that afraid. Mm. But it turns out to be the opposite because every fight is bigger, bigger. than the, the previous one. So you have more to lose. The stakes are higher. And you, you're more scared because you have more, like it's bigger and I, you have more to lose. It's, it's, a, it's an ego thing, you know? So... I realized that being afraid, it's normal. And I, and I, I remember at the time I seek help of many sport psychologists and many of them were trying to, to change my mind. They were trying to, to brainwash me. They were like, oh, George, they, stop saying you're afraid. You're not afraid. You're excited. You're mm -hmm. excited to compete. I'm like, maybe it's the langu language barrier, but excited, excité, you know, that's not all it makes me feel, I think. Like I'm, yeah. I'm excited if it's, you know, if it's minus 20 degree in Montreal and I know that next week I'm going to spend a, yes. a, a week in Miami at the beach, I'm excited, you know, or I, I sometime I'm, I'm excited. Let's say I fast for three days and I know I'm, I'm about to eat my favorite meal, mm. my favorite dish, I'm, I'm excited, you know, but I'm not excited to get into 
into a, a fight not knowing the outcome. I'm scared. And at one point, I, I told myself, I said, you know what? I don't need this BS. I, mm. I, I, there's no courage without fear. And I should not be afraid to admit that I'm afraid. And when I realized that, it made me, made me grow. And I realized also that fear, you can control it. But in order to control it, you need to be confident. Mm. And the way you, you build up your confidence, it's by preparation. Mm. How well you prepare yourself for the task ahead. And I know that every time I prepare myself the best as I can be, when I close my eyes and I know there is nothing else I can do to be more prepared than I am right now, I'm still scared of going mm. into a fight. But I know that I'm going there with confidence. Mm. And when you, you get ready for a fight to control your fear, you have to focus on the thing only that you can control. You have to be 100% objective about that. No, subjecti no subjectivity. There is no room for subjectivity. Subjectivity, for example, are stuff that how you feel. Don't focus on that. You as an entity, you do not exist. The only thing that matter, it's the things that you need to do in order to achieve your, your, what you want to do. For example, when you fight someone, like I'm going into a fight, I know that I need to do this, this, this in order to win. I need to stay for either all the way out or all the way in, never in mid-range. I know that I, I, I have to be fat to use my speed advantage. I know I, need, I have to use a lot of move, movement. That's what I need to focus on. It's very simple, but it's not so, it's simple in his, in, in his technicality sometimes, but it's not so simple in, the, in its application. Mm -hmm. So you need to be 100% objective. Don't try to focus on what the crowd gonna think, on what your opponent is gonna do, because you don't control these things. Mm -hmm. You only focus on the things that you control. And by doing, so, by doing so, you can control your fear. Mm. You will be afraid, but you will embrace it. You will go into the fight knowing that this fear, like Kosomoto, Mike Tyson coach used to say, fear can, can be your friend. It helps you cook your food, but it can be your worst enemy. It can burn you. Mm. And that's, you need to learn how to control that. And this is a skill that you learn. I learned that skill at a very young age in a, in a schoolyard because I was victim of bullying. Like I, 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 that's one of my advantage that I realized later, it turns out to, to, to make me stronger. Mm. Because I, I was fighting some guys sometimes that were older than me and I knew I could, I could not be the victor. You know, like I, 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 there's no way. So when I'm fighting in MMA, like many, many years after, and I'm fighting a guy that I am confident I can beat. Of course, I'm afraid of failure to make a mistake. Well, to zig when I should have zag, we're all afraid of, we're not perfect. Everybody can mess it up but I'm trying to focus only on things I control. Am I gonna win? Am I gonna lose? I don't control that. Mm. What, what, what people are gonna think? What is he gonna do? Is he taking steroid or not? I don't control that. But I know what to do to, be, uh, to fight at the best of my ability. And that's what I need to, to, to focus on. And if I focus on this, I know for a fact, 100%, I slope the odds of winning into my favor. Yes. It's a very wise approach. There's a definition of wisdom that I like that says wisdom is knowing the long-term consequences of your actions. And I think that's what you describe. And it's like inputs equal outputs. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about fighting here, but this is very analogous to life. Oh yeah. Life is a fight, right? And so many people aren't doing that. They're not asking the question of my inputs that I'm putting into the day-to-day -day choices with how I feed myself or who I spend time with. What output is that going to get me? Remove how I feel. Remove the subjective experience mm. for a minute and just get very objective. What I do has consequences. Add, add the things that I'm choosing going to build the future that I want to create. And the fear is not necessarily stepping in the octagon for the average person. It's the fear of change. It's the fear of setting that boundary. It's the fear of giving up the mouth pleasure and choosing to invest in yourself. So it's very analogous to life. It's not just for the cage, right? But the cage is an incredible teacher yeah. for life. It's a great teacher. Uh, and it taught me a lot. That martial art taught me a lot. And, and, and in life, you don't always do what you want to do or, or 
how you feel. You know, you have to go against that mm. very, very often if you want to be successful in what what you what you choose to be in life. It it, it has you have for, life forces you to get out of your comfort zone. Mm. It you have to. There, there is almost nothing that you can do in life to be successful and stay in your comfort comfort zone the whole time. It's it's just impossible. Yeah. Life doesn't work that 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 way. It throw at you some curveballs, some. Sometimes it's heartbroken. You're gonna you're mm. gonna have some some failures, some obstacles that you won't be able immediately to step over. You're gonna have to to come back later, and it, it, it's heartbroken, heartbroken. But that's life, mm. you know. And if you if you work hard and and you you know what I mean, you do you do what needs to be done. You know, a lot of times, sometimes people say oh, train hard. For example, that's one of the cliche: train hard, train hard. Yeah, train hard, but train smart. It's even more important. Yeah, yeah, very well said. I'm curious because you've had battles, obviously, in the physical realm, in the very literal realm inside of the cage, battles of the mind that we've spent some time talking about, but also battles with health. At the highest level of sport, you've yeah. dealt with ulcerative colitis for yeah. a long time. And since we're sitting here at Heart and Soil HQ and George has adopted a little bit more of an animal-based diet, you even have the amazing supplement warrior sitting in front of you. I'm curious now, like knowing what you know, you I have heard you speak in the past about the healing power of the fasting that yeah. you had to do. How much of that was an issue when you were actually competing? And do you think maybe it was caused by the stress component of what we're talking about here, the gut-brain connection, the weight cutting, that kind of stuff? Well, I, I, I first noticed, uh, I, my, 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 first my symptoms start when I was in the middle of my training camp of my last fight against uh, Michael Bisping. Why do you got to do that to my boy Bisping, by the way? <laughs> Come on, you got to do him like that, man? <laughs> well, he was trying to do it to me, was, so I had was. to do it to him. It was uh, do or die. But, but uh, yeah, I uh, I was trying to put on weight because I was competing mm, upper weight in, class, in right? a heavier weight class. So I was under the impression in order to have a better uh, performance against a bigger man, mm. I need to put on weight which was wrong at the time. Mm. I realized I made a mistake, but I, I, I didn't know at the time. It, I was a little bit uh, ignorant. It was the first time I ever did it. And uh, so I was trying to put on weight and, and I was forcing myself to eat like five to six times a day. Mm. I was very stressed and I developed certain symptoms. I had like cr very severe cramps, I had blood. When I, had to, when I went to bathroom, it was a lot mm. of blood. And it was so bad that at one point I thought I had like it because I have an history in my family of, of uh, uh, digestive, like a uh, gut problem. And even one of my, my grandfather, who, his name is Georges. That's why my name is George mm. because of my grandfather, he died of uh, uh, colon cancer. Mm. And um, I was very concerned because I was like, man, what the hell is this? And I was, because I was trying to put on weight in order to find out what was my problem, I needed to do what they call a colonoscopy. Yes. So they put a camera inside and to do that, they need to clean yourself. So they give you a bunch of laxatives yes. so it empty you. And I couldn't do that because I was trying to put on weight and the fight was just a, a few weeks away, wow. away. So I told myself at that time as, as I was like, whatever this issue is, I'm going to deal with it after the fight. You know, the fight is like four, four, four weeks left so i'm gonna deal with it after the fight and it was bad it was very bad so i i fought and i things turn turns out to be to go very well i won that the title at the medicine square garden and then after i came back uh in in canada uh and i did the colonoscopy and they found out i was I had the ulcer colitis and it, it's a condition that you're stuck for life and I was on severe medication. Very, mm. uh, I was on anti-inflammatory. I had to take these anti-inflammatory every every day. Mm. And uh, I made a lot of research because I don't like taking uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I don't have to, I always look for an alternative yes. uh, solution. And I found out that there's a doctor. His name is Jason Fung, and he he treats people that has diabetes and gut problem with fasting mm -hmm. uh, program. And it got me very interesting because I it, it, he had a, very, a lot of success. His mm -hmm. rate of success is huge. So I met with him and he, uh, he told me to, to do fasting. And I happened at the time to, to have a friend that I got in touch with that lost a lot of weight through fasting. And, and I remember he was like, his, even his skin was looked different. That he, he was, 
he improved his condition so much in a very small amount of time because of the fasting. So he got me very curious. So I started doing it. My friend, in less than a month, my symptom disappear, disappear. And I start to reduce the, the posology of my medicine to the point that I no longer mm. need it. And it really changed my life. And on top of that, I, uh, I start to get interesting into diet. And uh, I, start, I was talking to Paul Saladino and he, uh, I know a lot of guys like Joe Rogan tried the carnivore diet and you know they, they had a good, very good comment about it. A lot of the, all the people that I've talked to that tried the carnivore diet, they were like, oh, I've, I, I get more shredded, mm -hmm. I feel great, I don't have that uh, feeling after a meal that you, you're sleepy mm -hmm. because you don't have the carbs and, and the sugar. And I'm someone who loves sugar, you know? So I, I uh, decided to try it for one, one month. Man, it got me so ripped. Mm. I, I looked like I was on a, on a steroid cycle. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. It, it, like I, I'm normally very fit yes. already, but th when I did that one month carnivore uh, diet, I was jack like I was actually lighter a yeah. little bit than I am normally. But because of the illusion, my skin were like right on my muscle. I mm -hmm. looked like a like a bodybuilder. It made me look bigger. So I really liked what I what I saw, and I, and I liked the fact that it, it, it made my body less inflammation. Yes. So I remember I was able to recuperate a little bit faster. And, and uh, because I didn't have the sugar, I slept better. Mm. Um, so I, I, it changes me. It changed the, the way I was looking at things. You know, of course, now I'm, you know, I, I, I still went back to not my old way, but I still love chocolate, mm -hmm. pasta sometimes, mm -hmm. which is not recommended if you do a animal-based diet. But I'm more aware mm. of what I put in, in my body, you know, especially because you, you get old, I'm getting older. Yeah. And, and, and if I would have, a, if I could go back in time and talk to a younger George St. Pierre, I would, 100% would have uh, I talked to him about that. It, it, That's It's cool. a game changer, yeah. That's cool. Do you think, in, in hindsight, if you were to go back, um, you know, into the prime of your athletic career, that you would have chose to fuel for athletics in more of an animal-based and aligned way? Probably. I, 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 you know, I was young at the time, and I was always thinking, oh, I don't need to, to, to change anything because it's working. Yes. You know, some stuff I work, but I was, I was not really into dieting you yeah. know, because it was... It was working for me at the yes. time, but I believe you you diet not necessarily for performance. You diet for longevity mm -hmm. and health. You know, you do your service on your car. You know, I'm sure. Yeah. If you don't do your service, your car will break down faster. Yeah. And same thing for your your body. You need to take care of your body. You need to do your service on, on your body. And 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 this is for me the most important thing. So if I would have, I would have been aware of it, I would have done yeah. the carnivore diet. In, during my training camp, like yeah. like uh, a hundred, the animal based diet, a hundred percent during my training camp, not not exclusive carnivore, but yes. animal based, I would have done that in my uh, in uh, my training camp. And when I did the one month try of uh, it was not carnivore, it was uh, sorry, it was animal based. Yes. Maybe I didn't made a mistake, but it, it got me very healthy, very yes. sh shredded, and and I really like what I saw. The only problem is for me. I love sugar, man. Yeah. I love pasta. <laughs> I love uh, coffee. I love uh, uh, chocolate. And yes. when you you're you're doing an animal base, pure animal base, you're not allowed to take that. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it will increase your your result, your, yes. your performance. But uh, because I'm in everyday life, I love I love these things. For me, it's hard to do that uh, 24 seven. It's three. balance, right? Exactly. Like, almost enjoying life, and I always say, what you do the most matters most. So That's like right. a, almost like an 80, 20 principle, like if you get this thing right and your framework is an animal based diet and you're now out and you're, you're in Florida at the weekend watching the fights. And now you're in Austin and you, Austin, you want to go and have this world famous pasta dish. Like, okay, I know it's not going to serve my health goals the best, but I'm going to enjoy it. I'm making an informed choice. I'm okay with it. I'm generally keeping myself very fit and healthy. Then it's okay. Cause that's a very balanced perspective. I, right? I, I believe one thing too, that this people have this misconception of what is a healthy meal. Like sometimes they will, they will go for something more vegan with full of seed oil and mm -hmm. thinking that is healthier. 
which is completely the opposite. They're going the wrong way. You know what I mean? Seed oil is something I really try to avoid. It's a big know, one. At all costs, you know. I, I, like everybody else, I, I, I consume it sometimes, you know, because I, I'm, I'm... Restaurants. Yeah, 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 100%. But I try to avoid it as much as I can. When I try to eat LT at home, I try to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are, you are spot on. That's definitely... Uh... That's one thing that Paul really... Yeah. Uh, and the guys at Heart and Soil, like, made me aware of it. Like, the, the all the... The, the bad things like like the, the consequences of uh, a high consumption of mm. uh, seed oil it's terrible it's, it's the a, worst thing you can have I it's think. a big one yeah we talk a lot we have a framework here and number one is getting nutrient dense foods in the diet like organs like the liver like the heart that's in warrior number two is eliminate the processed foods and a huge focus in the processed food group is the seed oils and then yeah. it's all of these like ultra packaged mm -hmm. ultra processed refined flowers and extra Extra sweet, delicious, high fructose corn syrup. You know the deal. Yeah, uh, just one for one one example. Most of people, most of the of the audience right now that is listening to us, I'm sure if I give them the choice, what is the healthier, margar margarine or, yeah. or butter? I'm sure a lot of them will think it's mar margarine. Yes. It's it's completely wrong, completely wrong. And I was no different before I met Paul. Like I thought, like oh, it was more uh, yeah. healthy to go plant plant-based yeah. it's completely wrong it's it's worse you know what i mean so because of seed oil and uh, i think people need to be aware of it yeah and it's very in line with a uh, i think a topic that interests you a lot which is like this evolutionary theory of where we came from and who we are and how we used to eat and maybe that actually has a lot of standing in how we should eat moving forward and we weren't plant-based eaters we were certainly not vegans and there's 100 no cultural not. you know study of people that were so I think it's a, a really cool thing, especially when you get into this just deep thinking about why, who are we as a species and what are we doing here and bringing some of that very ancient wisdom that seems to be getting lost and trying to live that now. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I tried fasting and uh, animal base is f because of that. Uh, if you look at our ancestor, if you live through an ice age and Homo sapiens have lived through ice age. Yeah. Let's say you go uh, during the Pleistocene era in, a, in an Ice Age, Ice Age Europe. There's not a lot of uh, vegetable you can eat. You There's know, no broccoli? You, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then also when you, let's say you hunt a mammoth and you eat, you know, the old village eat. You don't know, you don't know when is the next time you're going to have a feast. Mm. So you eat as much as you can. And then maybe you'll stay a, a period of one, two, mm -hmm. three days without eating. You, you know what I mean? So there, there, there you have the, the fasting. So th there is different form of fasting. There is, it's called time restricted eating, mm -hmm. where you only consume your calorie on a on a time window during a day. Mm -hmm. And there's also prolonged fasting, where you can have a longer fast. And I, I'm the type of person who would, I don't like to be dependent on, on yes. things. I, I like to detach myself of everything. Of course, at one point you need to eat, yeah. you know, because you, you <laughs> you're gonna die. But I like the challenge of of uh, of not being dependent on, mm -hmm. on something. And and when I did the I did my first uh, three days water fast, it made me discover a, a total different uh, thing. You know, when I realized, I was like, wow. I was thinking that because I love people when when they I talk to them about it th this idea of fasting, they're like. Oh, I only tr I only stayed uh, half a day without eating, and man, I started. I, yeah. I was like freaking out. I can't last three days. But what they don't know is that when you do, for example, a three days fasting, the hardest part of it is the first day, the first yes. twenty four hour, the first twenty four to thirty six hour. After that, the the hunger goes away, and, and you you that's when the good stuff happen. You know mm -hmm. what I mean in in your body. And people are not aware of it, but you need, just need to go past that phase where it, it's going to get you uncomfortable, mm. and, and but it's not going to get worse. Yeah. You know, so it's really something worth investigating in, 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 if you're curious. It's, you hit something though that's really important, which in life, again, in general, not just with diet, but as an overarching theme, when it gets difficult is when most people stop. And if you really want great results and self-control and discipline, temperance, moderation, that's where you have to go. When it gets difficult, you're like, this is what it's supposed to be. Like, this is now where I get to grow. You said like, you know, a few minutes ago in our conversation that 
we don't grow inside of our comfort zone. We have to get outside of it. And fasting is a really cool way to do that because it's a, an, it opens a door in your mind of, oh, if I've been eating three meals a day, every day, mm. all of my life, and all of a sudden I just survived and not only survived, but felt really good in the absence of food. What other things are controlling me that I can practice this discipline on? Maybe it's too much of this, the mm -hmm. screen, the, the technology, the video games, the, whatever it is. But we need something that kind of introduces us to that world. That we're stronger than we think we are. Yeah. We have more control. But it's not going to be easy to take that back in a world that basically is fighting for it at every single turn. Yeah, 100%. You, to improve, you need to get out of your comfort zone. And, 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 and fasting and eating and, and, and also in, in sport. Yeah. Like one of the, one, we know scientifically it's proven that one of the things that a, a human, and I'm talking about an a, average person, not an, an elite athlete, one of the things that you can do to improve your longevity is exercise. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the best exercises is a squat, mm -hmm. like a w weightless squat, squat. It's probably and one of the best exercises you can do, and, and of course, if you do a squat, at one point, if you do a, a set of squat, you can have a hard have a hard time. I don't care who you are. Like if you're an elite athlete, if I if I make you, for example, depend everybody has a different ca capability. Someone who's not in shape, I ask him to do 10 squat. It might be very hard. Yeah. But someone who's an elite athlete, maybe he's gonna have to do a 200 squat. But in order to have the, those the result. To improve, you need to get into that zone, that zone where you get out of your comfort zone. So whatever you do, you have to get into that zone, that stress zone. There's different form of, of stress. There are good, there are bad stress, like mm -hmm. a fighter's flight stress, being anxious uh, when you watch the news and being afraid or live through, uh, like that 24-7. This is bad stress, mm. you know, but there is good stress. I want to, I wanna, for, for example, I have a better, bigger muscle. I, I had to go through a form of stress in order to, you know what I mean? If I lift weight in order to improve, this is, these are good stress. Yeah, I think that's a very important point because in a, in a culture now where all stress is bad, it's not. There's, no, there's it's a not. dose dependent response. I see you out there. You're still training hard. You're getting in the ice bath. That's an acute stressor, right? You don't want to get in that ice bath. You're like, oh, I'm doing this again. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, <laughs> this is another thing I, I, I like. I, I, I like to do things that could Im Im improve my my health. Um, I, 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 I love, I, I'm, I'm happy uh, about my, my, my fitness condition yeah. and my health, but I always try to get better. And, and, and uh, ice, bath, bath, ice bath is one of the things. Uh, you can use ice bath uh, for many different reasons. Uh, I like to use it in the morning because it boosts your dopamine level. Yeah. Also, it, it show, the science has shown that it, it increases your testosterone mm. if you do it first thing in the morning. And, and it's a good thing that you can act your body. You can, you can transform your body. The, the, one of the ways to change your DNA, DNA is through discipline. So you're doing a nice bath. And of course, it suck. You know, I'm no different. I'm, I'm a normal human being. When I wake up in the, in the morning and I'm like, oh, I got I, I, I to gotta do that ice bath. I, do, I don't do it every day, but I try to do it at least three to four times a week. Yeah. And it suck. You know, I get, out, I get in there and I'm like, God, it's extremely uncomfortable, but I'm used to it. I used to get out of my comfort zone. That's the difference between me and another person who's not, mm. who never did it. He might have a harder time because he never pushed himself into that, that discomfort. So I get through that zone every morning when I, when I do my ice bath. And I know for a fact that there is not one time I've done an ice bath and I regretted it. Mm. There is... Time before I do the ice bath, I'm like, shit, I don't want to do this. But after I'm done, this never happened. And I've done it hundreds of times. There's not a, a, a time that I said to myself, shit, I should not have done it. Because every single time is worth it. Because I surf on that dopamine level all day and it makes me feel great. Another thing I can use ice bath for is uh, before I go to bed, I like to mix uh, eat and eat hot. You don't want to do an ice bath before going to bed. You want yeah. because you want to use the ice bath as a dump of adrenaline. And mm -hmm. if you don't have an ice bath, you can use a shower. Mm -hmm. So you 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 go with hot water, then you switch to cold for a few seconds, then you back to hot, switch to cold. You do that a, f a few times, but before you go to bed, you finish with the hot mm -hmm. because your 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 
the core temperature of your body need to drop mm -hmm. be, to, to get into a, a good sleep. And by doing that, finishing with the hot, it will force your core temperature to, to, to drop, to cool down. So it's a good way to, to have a good night of sleep as well. Yeah. You, you don't want to use ice bath if you're trying to gain gain muscle mass. Yeah. You have to do it before, before. the training, not not immediately after. You have to wait a few hours after to if you want to try to gain uh, muscle mass. Yeah, yeah. The th the point that you made about never regretting doing the hard thing is so important. There's nobody like you said that regrets. Oh, I did. I won the battle over myself. Like you faced a lot of great opponents in the cage, but I bet you've not faced any opponent that's bigger than this one in here, right? Like, oh, your, your, your brain, yeah, it's important that you, you need to control it. It takes a lot of discipline. And and, and yeah, you, you train hard, you do the sacrifice, but you need to do it smart, you know? Yeah. Like like when, when you do something, know what, you tr what do you try to accomplish, yes. you know? Be aware of it. Don't do it because everybody do it, no. Do it and, and be aware of what you're trying to, what do you want, what mm. you're trying to accomplish, mm. what you really want in life, not what your parent want for you or your friend or what people tell you to do. What do you want? Once, once you know what you want, you know where it gives you a sense of direction. Now you know where to go. Mm. Uh, yeah, now, it, now that's when we talk about you build up your team. You know, there's all these people, you have some good, positive people around you, some negative people around you. Use the negative people to give you to to, to give you the, the motivation to prove them wrong. Yes. You know, like and, and do it. And then after you have to work hard. Hard, 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 hard until you make it. Yeah. When you work hard and you start to be successful, I remember in my career when I start to be successful, a lot of you see a lot of athletes or people in business when they start to, to be successful, they, they try to, to buy they go for the luxury, you know, mm. right away. Right away they, they make it, they go for luxury. But what they don't realize is if you're on top and you stay there, you don't improve, the game will catch up to you. I don't mm -hmm. care in which business you are, if you're in sport or medicine or whatever, if you're if you're a a, 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 a dentist. And you're and you open a, an office and your things are going well. Your 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 competitor will catch up to you eventually if you don't get better. So you need to invest on yourself to improve. As a fighter, I always invest. I, when I start making money, I was not going for luxury right mm. away. I was investing on myself. I was paying myself some trip to Thailand to mm. to learn new Muay Thai Muay Thai skill to Brazil to learn some. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu move to trip to different place in US to train with different training partner mm. that will bring me something. So I improve. I, I I knew I was on top when I was in my early stage of my career. I became champion, but I wanted to stay on top. Mm -hmm. So invest on yourself, you know, because the 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 the, the, compet the, the competition will catch up to you. And once you you're there and you make it, try to and, and I'm saying this not because I'm trying to look good. I'm trying saying it for real. You try to give back mm -hmm. and give back. It's it's not because you're a nice guy. That's not what I'm trying to 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 look like a nice guy. You give back. It's a little bit in a selfish way because you you give back only to the cause of the people that you care about. Mm. So it by giving back to these people, it will give you more motivation to do more to be more successful because you know you can give back to people that you care. I don't give back to everybody. There, there's, mm. there's tons of charity that came to me. Sometimes I can't give to everybody as I'm, I'm going to end up broke. You know, like I don't have enough than 24 hours in a day too. But I only give back to the cause and the people that I care. Mm. And it, it makes me happy to make these people happy. So it forces me to perform and to, have, to be more successful because I know if I have more success, I'll be able to make them more happy. So, so that's how you, you use that to your advantage. Yeah. You know? So it's a good it's good thing to give back, but give back because it makes you happy as well and it makes people happy. Yeah. And we can continue lifting other people it, up. It, it will bring you more joy more more joy than you you can even imagine. Yes. Yeah. It always feels better to give a gift than to receive one, right? A hundred percent. When you've put yourself in a position like you have, you now have extra energy to give back to the right kind of people. It very much reminds me of Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And a lot of people talk about the hero's journey. It's like, it's played out in all of our movies. Star Wars, you know, Luke Skywalker meets Obi-Wan Kenobi, fights his father, he loses his hand, he meets the wise people. 
But it's never just about this big battle, like winning the welterweight championship of the world. It's about what happens after that. It's mm -hmm. about the journey home. It's about the return. And it's about who am I now? And what do I get to give back? So what do you want? What is next for George? You know, in a, in a life full of high, highlight reels that have been on public display, winning championships, called the GOAT, what is next? Where do you continue to just find joy and presence and how are you giving back? And what's the next thing? What's the next project? What's the next phase of life for you? Yeah, my, my life of uh, trying to prove I'm the strongest man in the world is, is, is over. You know what I mean? I, I might still compete in different things, you know, if it's a good cause, you know, like, like, like for fun, you know, like, but, but nothing... I don't take myself too seriously in, in that regard, you know, because it's done. That phase of my life is done. And and uh, I think in life, you never want to be satisfied. I'm I'm happy about what I've done, but I want more. I have mm. other, I turn my, I turn into different goals now. I'm more sort of an entrepreneur, sort of mm -hmm. like I, I'm, I'm involved with Heart and Soil, a uh, food supplement company that, that, I like organs because mm -hmm. I think animal organs are the most nutritious food mm -hmm. uh, on the planet. And I want to make the world discover that. I want to share that with the world. This for me is very important to be involved in the health. Uh, I, I have a, a, a online equipment because a lot of uh, places, like I know in, in Texas it was different, but like uh, where I, in Canada, it was crazy. They, they closed everything in, in, during COVID. The gyms, everybody lo lose their, a lot of people lost their businesses and, and it was insane. So people, a lot of people got health issue because they, they were not too able to be active. So I, I sell uh, um, equipment online that they can train from the, their home. Mm. Uh, I also have um, a lot of opportunity. I have a, a vodka that will come that comes out. Uh, I have a, yeah, I have a lot of a movie opportunity uh, now. Nice. So I I'm busier than I ever been, and it makes me happy. Awesome. You know, and in the same time I. I have different charity. I can help the, the people that, that, that are in needs that I care about, you know, and uh, the cause that I care about. Yeah, that's beautiful, brother. Before we bring on a couple of callers to chat to you live, I have one last question from me. In that world of the highlight reels that you've got and just this adoration from the MMA community and the celebration of a champion, what is your personal most proud moment? It may be that. It may be something completely different. What is George proud about the most so far to this point in his life? What I'm the most proud of is, it's hard to say, it's also something that people don't know about me. Mm. But it's my it's my treasure. It's uh, A lot of people see my, my achievement in the sport and they're like, oh my God. Is... But it's nothing compared with with my my personal life mm. with, with, with my with f this is my personal life family this is the thing that i'm the most proud of but i i because i'm so pr proud of i i kept it i kept it i never put it in social media never put it online nobody's aware of it but it's the same thing mm -hmm. it's the thing is 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 the thing that i'm the most proud of mm -hmm. I, I think Whatever you do in life, try to have a very strong nucle nucleus. You know, like this, it all starts from that. You know, let me to have your 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 foundation very very strong, and that's the thing that I'm the most proud of. In the same time, and and, and yes, it is the thing that I'm the most proud of. And most people would be tempted to to think that oh, you should share it with the rest of the world, but I don't because it's 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 personal to me to me. And I live through a, a crazy uh, industry. Um, you see, for example, like Khabib, when he fought Conor McGregor, like for me, you can attack me. You can attack me. I, I, I'm good. I put a shield. I, I take every kind of yeah. insult. But if you try to attack someone that I care about or I love, now it's, it's going to be hard for me. Yes. So I also did that for a, a protection mechanism mm. because I know I live through a crazy industry. And you don't want to fight emotional, right? No, yeah. exactly. That was something that I always hide. And 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 you, you want to hide your the, mo the most vulnerable part of, mm. of, of who you are. And for me, it, it, it was designed that way on purpose yeah that's beautiful man and i'm sure your family and i think it's there's some magic in keeping some things close to your chest a hundred percent a hundred percent it's it's the beauty in it it's beautiful uh, you know what i mean for me the most important thing is 
that's what it is and i and i kept it for myself yes yeah. good for you brother good for you well we have a chance to chat with some live callers now so they're going to jump on they're going to ask you a couple of questions and you can just have a good old conversation like they're in the room with us so oh, yeah the first person on the call today is kevin who's actually a texas native and uh yeah kevin if you're with us jump on say hello and uh what questions have you got for georges Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Uh, first time caller, long time listener. I got a question for you, George. Man, I've been rolling jujitsu since 2009, and it's you know it's kind of been a fabric to my life for a long time. And I'm 36 now, and I just find I get injuries a little bit more frequently when I'm rolling. So I decided a few months ago that I was going to hang it up. And uh, you know, I've gone through this cycle a couple of times where I'm like, uh. I'm not going to roll anymore. And I put my gi in a, as far as spot away from me as possible. So it's hard to pull it back out. And every time I get back in the gym. Um, and so now I have decided that, that I am done with jujitsu. And I know that, you know, you've probably experienced similar things where when you start doing jujitsu or Muay Thai or whatever the combat sport is that you're training, it's like so hard to fill that spot with another sport. You know, it feels like you got a void there that uh, is impossible to fill. So how do you fill yours now that I don't know if you're still training as much as you used to, but uh, I'm sure you can kind of relate to that problem, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. And one, one piece of advice I can tell you, um, you need to look at your problem. What is the cause of your problem? You say the cause of your problem is your, your jujitsu might not be the cause of your problem. You know, you, you have to investigate on that. To not push, put a band-aid on the, the injury. You need to find the cause. What caused it? Very often, like when you do a sport, like doing sport is healthy, but doing sport to the elite level, it's not so healthy. And, and I, I notice uh, for myself that, for example, jiu-jitsu, I take jiu-jitsu uh, as an example. It's, it's a sport that has, it's very centered towards isometric muscle tension. It's a lot of squeezing, a lot of, mm. the, post, the posture is not good if you only do jiu-jitsu jiu because you're bent over. And, and if you look at what we do in life, we drive our cars, we, the, we eat, we're sitting at the table, we're bent over. We're always bent over. So you need to find something that counter that in order, I believe, to stay healthy. Uh, you need to do something that is very dynamic because jujitsu is very isometric. You need to do something that undo what you do all the time. If you go, if you're, you have a perfect center life, you'll stay healthy. But if you go left, 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 you'll, you'll derail. Or if you go right, 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 you'll derail. So if you go left, you need to find something that's gonna bring you, that's gonna push you right. So it will bring you towards the center a little bit more. So I think you should investigate on that instead of, of giving up, thinking that jiu-jitsu is the cause of all your, all your problem. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's your training partners are maybe too big or are too rough with you. Um, are you, you have, you have maybe posture problem, health issue. Uh, you need to investigate on that. Maybe do, for example, for me, jiu-jitsu, one of the great counter to jiu-jitsu is Olympic lifting. Because Olympic li lifting open you up, you know, but focus yeah. on the form, not on the weight. It's, mm. it's about the, the, the form. So maybe you should investigate a little bit more on that, uh, I think, before thinking of, of what to do outside of jiu-jitsu. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, man. I, I think that's a great point. It's... And it's not like the, you know, I wouldn't say it's the cause of all my problems. It's just like I have this, you know, jujitsu feels like this primal sport that I feel other sports can't feel. And I've already accepted that, like, it may not be for me as I approach 40 years old. And I'm fine with that. Like, I'm, I'm not really thinking about injury prevention here. I'm just trying to figure out what the next primal activity I can do to fill that. Because, you know, you... It doesn't matter if you're surfing big waves or snowboarding or jumping out of airplanes. Like, there's not another feeling you get in sports that's similar to rolling uh, jujitsu. Do you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, how do we fill that primal gap? 
yeah, it, it's it's like a pair of shoes, you know, like some certain things will fit me, might not fit you. Certain things will fit you and not fit fit me. And you need to find something maybe that, that challenges challenges you. Uh, it could be drawing, it could be, you know, it could, could be it could be music, it could be whatever it is. Whatever it is, you need to find it for yourself. You know, you need to, to investigate on yourself. Sometimes it's, it, you know, you see, you see a lot of people are very good to give advice, but when they look at, at themselves in the mirror and try to really find out what they want, that's the hardest part. And I'm even talking about myself. It takes a long time. It's hard to know yourself. What, you, what do you really want? You have to go through that process of trying new things. Maybe you'll, if you try things and be patient and give it a try, maybe you'll find something that will uh, replace uh, jujitsu and, and make, make you happy. And Kevin, I'm going to jump in real quick here because we were talking before we went live with George about a um, little meniscus cleanup that he got. And I hurt my meniscus doing jujitsu and my other knee doing jujitsu. And it's a sport that we love and it's a sport right. that sometimes we can sacrifice some of our, I guess, maybe our joints and our longevity sometimes. And love all of George's points about mobility and training for longevity. But something I did this last year to touch, I think, what you're talking about, which is this primal need for competition that's especially alive in men. We just want to kind of lock horns and go is I, I temporarily yep. put away the rash guard and the gi to let my body heal and transitioned into something else that was giving me that competitive fire, which for me was CrossFit, which includes a lot mm -hmm. of Olympic lifts. And it is competitive. Mm -hmm. um, it's not for everyone, of course, but it, gave, it, it filled that need. And that's the one thing I'm pulling out more than anything else, is it filled the need for me for healthy competition, um, but with a little less wear and tear on the body. Um, it's not quite as fun as locking arms and under undering over undering with George here and chasing guillotines, but it's very close and it does a good job. So maybe there's something for you there, but we appreciate you calling in Kevin and best of luck finding what that next thing is for you. And uh, next up, we've got Brendan from Virginia. Brendan, you on the line? How you doing, sir? Um, so my question is, uh, it's pretty similar to Kevin's in that, you know, just looking for something. Uh, for me, it's more like a looking for a first. My question is, how do you, uh, how do you know when a relationship? So I think the thing that I'm most looking for is, is a community, sort of like a social network, how to build that up. My question is sort of how do you, how do you choose, how do you kind of filter through all the people, not in a, a like a, a bad way, I guess, but like, how do you know when a relationship is, you know, you've got your friends and family you grow up with, you've got relationships you're starting and ending all the time. I guess my question is how do you filter through this? How do you decide when a relationship has, has sort of run its course. How do you decide, like, no, I absolutely need to stick, stick this out and, like, keep going, whether that's with a coach or a business partner or, like, friendships. Um, so I guess that question sort of – there's a lot in there. Sorry, it's not super clear. But just, like, how do you pick, pick people to surround yourself with? How do you know when they're not, like, a good fit to have around you anymore? Obviously, that's a lot of it and depend on what your goals are. So it's, it's a little hard to answer, but I'm just curious how you, how you think about it. Well, what I can tell you from my experience is you have to follow your gut feeling at first. Sometimes it's impossible to know if it's the right choices until you know, you know what I mean? And, and they always say that the best way to learn is through other people's mistake and you don't want to repeat their mistake. But sometimes you need to learn from your own. There's no other way that you can learn by, learn by doing your own mistake. And you need to be willing to... to to fail in life, you know what I mean? Everything you, you try to, to do in life, you, you have chance of, chances of, of failure, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's always a question of odds. But you try to build up your team of your, and, and surrounding the people that you can trust that are competent to do things. Um, you know, like, <clears throat> and, and, and it's like a, a pair of shoes, you know what I mean? Cer cer certain things might fit well for me, but might not fit well for you. I think you need to give it a try. Be willing to give it a try. Have a leap. Uh, sometimes you need a leap of faith mm. to trust people. And sometimes you will be disappointed. You will be heartbroken. But it's part of the journey, my friend. I think you, you need to, to, to have a leap of faith to people. To give them a chance. You, you cannot close your door all the time and not let anybody in. You, you have to let people in. Give it a try. And it's by doing that, that you, you will grow as a human being and you will learn, you know, and then follow your gut feeling. That's one of the pieces of advice I can tell you. 
Yes, sir. Thank you so much. That was awesome. And um, when you're speaking there, George, I'm thinking of um, the level of vulnerability that that requires sometimes. And there's a strength in vulnerability. You said earlier in our conversation, you realized it was it was okay not to be afraid of being afraid. And this vulnerability builds from that conversation too, because I heard Gabo Mate say, uh, he's a psychologist, studies trauma a lot, that vulnerability comes from um, the root word of uh, wound. So mm. be, to be vulnerable is to be willing to be wounded. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to be wounded, and that's usually what we guard against. But that's when we close off maybe a little too much, right? We have to give certain people benefit of the doubt. We have to at least be strong enough to be vulnerable sometimes. I, a failure can be very a, a, fail, a failure experience can be very traumatizing, but the scars show where you've been. They don't yeah. have to dictate where where you where we're going. So it's important that yeah, it's not because you you fell one time that you're always gonna fail. You know what I mean? You learn, you grow, you you. You improved. You're not the same as you were before. You yes. change. We all do stupid mistakes. I, I've done stuff in my life that I'm not so proud of, but I'm not the same person that I was. I, I change. I, I'm different. And sometimes you need to learn how to, to love yourself and accept yourself for that. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're different than what you were. You know, you're, you're, you're better. You always try to get bet to be better. Beautiful, beautiful. And that requires, again, that warrior ethos and that mentality. And I forgot to say to both Kevin and Brendan that if we're going to be a warrior, then let's support ourselves physiologically like a warrior and we'll get you guys a bottle of free uh, warrior from George's because that's the one that's at least going to support you, give you the confidence internally to go after stuff and put yourself out there. Beautiful. Oh yeah, uh, my hardest win, my, my, the toughest, the best fighter and the hardest win was again, my, my first fight with BJ Penn. Mm. He was, when BJ was, his, was in his prime, he was just the perfect fighter. He was good everywhere. He didn't have any weaknesses except one. And I exploited it. And it took me a lot of research to find out the chic in his armor. And that's why I did a lot better in, in my second fight with him than I did in my first fight. BJ was faster than me. He had a better reaction time. He was just incredible. He was better than me on the ground, better than me standing up when we first fight. I was able to beat him in a very, very close decision. I was, it was very, very hard. I beat him more because of my will then my skill, I had to push myself through hell to beat him. It was very close. And then when I fought him the, the second time, I learned how to know myself and know my opponent. I learned how to, how I could become the perfect nemesis to him. I knew he was faster than me, so I was not trying to be, to beat him with, with speed. I had a guy that worked with me, he was a, a scientist, he was measuring reaction time of all the, the entire UFC roster. And, and BJ Penn had the best reaction time of all the roster in the UFC. I'm talking about prime BJ Penn. So if I tried to beat BJ Penn by speed, I would not I would not get it. But I also found out that BJ Penn has a very high rea reaction time, but a poor reset time. A reset time, your, your nervous system is a little bit like a muscle. So... I knew that BJ, if I try to go first, I'm not going to get him. But they, if I make him flinch and he react to me, because it was built a, in terms of uh, nervous system, a little bit like a sprinter. He was very, very fast, but not much endurance. So if I could load up his nervous system by doing a lot of fake and make him flinch and, and react and this and that and make him uh, being aware of all the mm -hmm. threat, making making make myself look like I'm, I'm pausing more threat than I really try to want, want, want what I'm trying to do, that was the secret to beat him. So I beat BJ Penn because I had knowledge that he didn't have. And for me, that was the, the best fighter I fought, the, the, the toughest fight. And, and what I'm very proud of is how I changed myself from the first fight to the second fight that I had with him. 
yes, I have more skills, I'm better, but I, the second time I beat him shows that I beat him. Not necessarily because I'm that much better than I was, that because I, I was smarter. Mm. I, 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 I had some knowledge that he didn't have. And that's one of the things that, that I'm uh, very proud of in my career. You have a couple examples of that too, where you had um, um, a couple of fights with someone and maybe a more difficult first time out, but you came back and used a lot of yeah. brain power, the element of surprise. I'm thinking of Matt Hughes. I'm thinking about Matt Koscheck. Sarah and yeah. Koscheck. Yeah. I'm always very, I'm the best at rematches. Yeah. I, have a, I have a very good ability, a learning ability. So when you do something to me, you cannot do it twice. I have yes. a, I'm very good at learning. Uh, and this is a form of athleticism. Mm. Uh, we think of uh, someone who's athletic is only about physical to, to be fast, strong. Yeah, but it, 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 the nervous system is, is, it's really what gives you your athletic mm. ability. So everything comes through the nervous system. You know what? Usain Bolt runs fast, not because of this only of his muscle. Mm. Actually, it's more, he runs, he's the fastest man in the world like, because of his nervous system. Mm. And it's the same thing in combat sport. You're you're a good fighter because of your nervous system. You know, your brain, of course, but your nervous system that what makes all the difference. And a lot of people don't know about that. They think it's all about muscle. Yes. Or they talk about oh fast twitch muscle, slow twitch muscle muscle. Yeah, but there there is guy that have I'm more a fast twitch muscle guy, but there's guy that are slow twitch muscle slow twitch muscle who are doing very well. For example, like Nick Diaz, yeah. John Fitch, the great, great, amazing fighters. Uh, you know, uh, in gra grappling, uh, yeah. Gordon Ryan, like it's amazing. So you you have to be able to ex, ex to use what you have. Everybody is gifted, but in different ways. You have to to learn how to optimize what you have and and use it to the best of your ability in order to be successful. It's a very good point. Play to your strengths, minimize your weaknesses. Cool. Do we have anybody else? All right. So that's it, man. GSP. Thank you so much. What a pleasure having you here at HQ, hanging out with the tribe. We're going to eat some steaks. We're going to eat some fruit. We're going to throw around some warrior. Do you have any parting words of wisdom? Do you want to send the audience anywhere to keep up with you? What have you got for us to close this one out? Well, I want to say thank you. It, it, it has been a very long journey for me uh, since I, I stepped into the, this world of uh, being a public figure. And I just feel very, very lucky. Uh, to have the support of, of my fans, my old fans, my new fans. I, I went to the UFC last uh, Saturday and uh, and I felt a lot of love and I, it really touches me. Mm -hmm. It really do. And uh, one of the reasons that I still have the motivation to do a lot of the things is because of the fans. You know, it makes people happy. And, and when, you know, we try to not always look at the critics, but I think it's important sometimes. You know, sometimes you have good words, you have some bad word. But I, to fit, when I went back on Saturday uh, at the Israel Adesanya fight, and I felt the the love, and it really it really boosts my energy, really, and and makes me very happy. And I feel very privileged. And I want to say thank you to to all the audience for the support they give me. Well, you're an inspiration for millions, man. And it's a lot of not just what you did inside of the cage, but it's who you are outside of the cage as a very well-rounded human and a seeker of truth and a person that's genuinely got a good heart and an incredible set of physical skills as well. So thank you for being who you are and paying that forward. Fam, that's it. I mean, what a chat. Thank you, George. Thank you, everybody, thank you, for watching. We will see you next time. Peace out. All right, friends, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We got a fresh new podcast for you every Wednesday. If you enjoyed the show, consider liking, subscribing, reviewing, and rating us on your podcast platform. It helps to spread this message of radical health. We'll see you next week.